My name's Charlotte Wetton, I'm a poet, and I'm really happy to be part of such a unique conference today. But today I'm going to do a performance poem for you. Um, when I saw the call out for abstracts of this conference, I was actually working on this poem at the time. And I immediately felt a connection because this poem looks at how stories are passed on in families, particularly stories about education and getting on in life. And I was interested in how these stories can subtly embed or encode multiple disadvantages in how they're passed on by family members. So the reason I brought this poem to the conference is not because my own family history is so unique or important, but because I would love it if this poem makes people think about their own family stories that have been passed on to them and what more subtle messages or signals might have been encoded into how those stories were told to you. Okay, let's go. <laughs> My poem is called Silver Service. There's no name for non-rape. For the evening class, Nan didn't do. To be a silver service waitress in a smart black dress. Sibilant promise of silver service in big hotels in town. It was eight road crossings, two gullies and a stairwell. It was not a nice area and it was winter. It's how my mother tells it. Meaning in this non-story, it was dark. Meaning but not saying what that means. Nan went for a time learning all the fancy terms about hollowware and flatware and folding napkins into flowers. But it was not this area. The streetlight out at the corner a blind bend on the stairs. She walks quick in the dark so no one thinks she's on the game, puffing in the cold, keys spiked in one hand, brolly out in the other. Looking over her shoulder, listening for footsteps for any little sound, heart beating faster to the gully with no lighting. The fancy names going round. Cloches, fishforks, platters, goblets, flutes and creamers. So logically, the ending's preordained in the way my mother tells it. Of course, she gave up silver service. Of course. Four kids plus no husband plus a packing line wage doesn't equal taxis home. And the non-taxi in this non-story has a name. I now know, as Nan didn't, that universities see intersectionality, which means the crossroads of fucked upness, the point where no one helps you because there's too much going on, gets too much to explain how there's no word for non-rape, for non-taxi. No word for the point where Nan gets home, hurrying to the safety of the little locked gate, legs aching from the hip down to find two kids out of bed, one with a temperature, and thinks, no, I can't. I can't keep fighting the fear of the walk and a full shift at work and the worry of the kids waking up and will they be safe by the time I get back and the dark isn't safe and the kids in the dark and I can't. Of course she gave up silver service. Of course. It's all so logical, the way my mother tells it. It was not a nice area and it was winter, meaning but not saying what that means. Nan makes some hot milk, puts them back to bed, takes the weight off her legs, folds up the black dress. And while she's doing this that winter night in 66, four public schoolboys are unloading the canoes, smoothing out their sleeves, having paddled down the Amazon in brogues. They're guffawing by the boats at the triumph of the trip. Well done, Bertie, good man, Jaunty. Now they're planning to break Greenland. What a journey, what a story. Eight road crossings, two gullies and a stairwell. No taxi, no silver service class, no better pay than a packing line, no saving for a rainy day, putting a bit by and getting on. There was no name for the non-rape in my nan's non-story at the crossroads of fucked upness the university's called intersectionality. Thank you very much. I want to start by acknowledging that I am a generational settler in Canada, which means my ancestors um, came to Canada, well, which wasn't Canada, and 
So I currently am I'm an uninvited guest on the Wasonich, Esquimal, and Songhees Nation, um, but and who's and, and it's unceded territory, which means there's no treaties. It's just land that was stolen, and more than the territorial territorial acknowledgement, what most matters is thinking about how not only I walk on this land and in my relationships, but also how I do my research. Do I contribute to further colonization or decolonization as a white woman um, from, so I, it's okay to stumble and fumble with this, but I am very, very gracious that I get to um, be in school and be on these lands and be alongside amazing people. So the poem I'm about to share with you, um, I want to dedicate it to all the women who could not access education, to all the women who have been pushed out of Canadian universities, to the women who walk alongside me and to the women who will come after me. So here we go. I scrub, I scrub my skin raw, but I can't wash away the stain of poverty. Yet, I scrub my skin with my red worn hands, ruthlessly with hard cover, soft cover, electronic textbooks, academic journals. I scrub my skin with theorists, sociological, colonial, patriarchal. Theories tangle into a mishmash of barbed wire. My confidence, my creativity is destroyed like metal scratching pads on slick shiny Teflon. Looks like Teflon frying pans, rejected, scrapped, dumped off, discarded at the corporate faux value village. Foucault, Bourdieu, Marx, Weber, Weber, don't pay my tuition, my rent, don't give me, don't contribute to my retirement, don't give me hope, even for a break. I scald my soul with the analytical, the theoretical, the generalizable, the unchangeable, but I can't wash away the stain of poverty. I came out of the social underclass closet on the Canadian higher education landscape. My skin, my body, my entire being is embodied, imbued, embedded as a one dimensional woman. Stigma, stigmatized, other, othered, othering. Cast in a box, outsider within, outsider without, we're the wretched of the earth. We're many subjects, revolting, disgusting, illegitimate, wasteful, useless, pointless. A disposable population, moral outcasts, the underclass, Marx's hated lumpen proletariat. The unwashed, the lower classes that smell, the hated, despised, ridiculed white trash. The deserving, undeserving, poor, battled out in the center while we live in the shadows and margins. You degrade me. You call me and my ancestors white trash. Then you all hold white trash theme parties. Welfare queens. We're the welfare kings. We're stigma machines branded with infamy. Leaves me with bruises, a bloodied, bloody mess of bruise stained hurts. My knees are shot to shit from trying to cross the wrong side of the social class tracks. Stay in your lane, you say. Slivers that crowbars can't dislodge from trying to climb the broken class ladder back down to the prop to the bottom rung from whence you came, you say. 
You offer up your stick and barbed wire encrusted carrot, burn me alive and dead with suffocating student loans, generously topped with your interest compounded daily. Squandering our riches, you say. You squander our richness, we don't say. How many students are homeless? No one knows, not yet considered an epidemic. Might be another academic career booster, Canadian taxpayer funded academic research topic. How many students go hungry? No one knows. Just another epidemic, maybe. Just another, oh, this has potential, Canadian taxpayer funded academic research topic. How many students are from poverty? No one knows. No one cares to know. We're not supposed to be here. Are we here? Poverty not considered an epidemic. Never gonna be another taxpayer funded academic research topic. Poverty, intergenerational poverty. It's deeply embedded in my self identity, part of my embodied being. The shame was bearable until university. A place I believed was never, never, ever meant for people like me. I lived in fear of being, on being, outed and ousted. And then I was outed of the social underclass closet. And then I was ousted, pushed out as a doctoral student, a Vanier scholar from my beloved discipline, sociology, from my belief in otherwise, from within, of imagining otherwise because I imagined otherwise, because I dared to critique power, the abusers, the users, the faux teachers, the faux social justice advocates, the faux equity, diversity, inclusion leaders, the ignorers, deniers of social class, inequality, inequity, marginalization, exclusion, violence. Jacked up capitalism, rabid neoliberalism, servitude neo-feudalism, 150 plus years of colonialism, relentless burgeoning isms, isms entrenched in Canadian universities, institutions. Shh, there's no classism. Angela Mayu, yes, I still rise, but I will move along. But, and you, Canadian universities, you need to hear this. I'm no Lurden Lemming. I've always been a moth to an injustice flame. I've never walked quietly. I'll make a fuss, but I won't go over the cliff without making a ruckus. But I'm leaving because Canadian universities, your education promised a way out of poverty. Your venerated piece of paper lauded as the great equalizer. No. You broke your promise. You continue to break your promise. Your taxpayer funded Canadian university, it's no landscape for a good underclass woman. I'd like to dedicate two, two poems uh, to all of you. Uh, the, the first is a short piece written by the, by the, the great um, the educational uh, genius, the poet, the Indian poet, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, who wrote uh, this piece in 1916. Listen to these words, 1916 it was written. I know what a risk one runs in being styled an idealist in these days when the sound that drowns all voices is the noise of the marketplace. And yet, I feel that the sky and the earth and the lyrics of the dawn and the dayfall are with the poets and the idealists and not with the market men. 
I know what a risk one runs in being styled an idealist in these days when the sound that drowns all voices is the noise of the marketplace. And yet I feel that the sky and the earth and the lyrics of the dawn and the dayfall are with the poets and the idealists and not with the market men. And my last gift offering to, to all of you with in, in, all, in all respect and all admiration for the work that you do is a, an adaptation of, of, of a poem that uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the, uh, the, 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 the wonderful beat poet of the 1950s who at 101 years old is still living uh, in San Francisco. This piece was written in 1975, but I have adapted it, as you will hear, uh, for this conference. And uh, it, the title of the poem is Working Class <clears throat> Academics as Insurgent Artists. I am signaling you through the flames the North Pole is not where it used to be. Manifest destiny is no longer manifest. Civilization self-destructs. Nemesis is knocking at the door. What are working class academics for in such an age? What is the use of working class academic work printing press made poetry so silent it lost his song. Make it sing again. If you would be a working class academic, create works capable of answering the challenges of apocalyptic times, even if this means sounding apocalyptic. If you would be a working class academic, write living newspapers be a reporter from outer space, filing dispatches to some, some supreme managing editor who believes in full disclosure and has a low tolerance for bullshit. If you would be a working class academic, experiment with all manner of poetics, erotic broken grammars, ecstatic religions, heathen outpourings, speaking in tongues, bombastic public speech, automatic scribbling, surrealist sensing, streams of consciousness, found sound, rants and raves to create your own limbic, limb, limb, <clears throat> your own limbic your own underlying, your ur voice. If you would call yourself a working class academic, don't just sit there. Working class academic work is not a sedentary occupation, not a take your seat practice. Stand up and let them have it. Have wide angled vision, each look a world glance. Express vast clarity of the outside world, the sun that sees us all, the moon that strews its shadow upon us, quiet garden ponds, willows where the hidden thrush sings, dusk falling along the river run, and the great spaces that open out to the sea, high tide and the heron's call, and the people, and the people, the people, yes, all around the earth, speaking in babble tongues, give voice to them all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. What an absolute privilege it is to join this event, even so late in the day. That last poem, Buddy, absolutely spoke to my soul. Thank you for sharing that. I need very much to uh, track that down. Uh, as we've just heard, I've shared on uh, the Twitter feed there my poem, Posh Things, which is about growing up poor, not working class poor, that word, across the 60s and 70s. Uh, I've written poetry since I was five and six years of age, but the system never saw this in me, never encouraged this in me. My father didn't get a lot of schooling in Ireland. My grandfather couldn't read and write. I nearly died of um, rheumatic fever when I was three years of age. 
I made it to university, but I, I struggled socially when I got there. Um, I'd never been in a restaurant. I'd never been in a train. I got to university at the time of the minor strike and found that didn't fit in. I did 18 months um, unemployed in the mid 80s, 18 months working in a sausage factory. Uh, began managing uh, social housing that I'd grown up in and ended up uh, managing several million pounds of regeneration money uh, in the early part of uh, the 2000s. Um, I dropped out, I took redundancy to pursue my poetry in 2011. And these days after the Manchester bomb, I was honoured with a, an honorary doctorate, a doctor of letters by the University of Salford. Ironically, the university that I um, dropped out of. I'm going to share a poem. Uh, we've had Kit Duval on earlier in the conference, I believe. And this Peter Telford would make a nice bookend uh, to the conference. Uh, Kit, as you know, uh, instigated and edited a wonderful anthology called Common People, published by Unbounders a couple of years ago. Uh, an anthology of working class writing which I'd really encourage you to track down. This is the poem that opened that uh, book and Peter tells me would make a, a nice closing note for the conference today. Thank you for what you've done. Uh, it sounds like a really important event that I look forward to watching the video back and being involved in the future. Here's my poem, Tough. They don't like it when we make it, despite all their ifs and cuts. They don't like it when we take it as our right to shake things up. They don't like it when rough voices start demanding better choices, but it's tough. We've had enough. We are coming. They don't like it when our stories rise above the kitchen sink. They don't like it when we learn, remember, organise or think. They don't like it when we've knowledge, so they price us out of college. But it's tough. We've had enough. We are coming. They don't like it when we're standing on our own, on our own terms. They don't like it when our candle lights another so it burns. They don't like it when we're spotted in a slot they've not allotted. But it's tough. We've had enough and we are coming. They don't like it when we uppity and throw a ladder down. They don't like it when we've sussed it and we grow and gather round. They don't like it when we minions have articulate opinions. But it's tough. We've had enough and we are coming. They don't like it when our pens begin to join up all the dots. They don't like it but when we send what we have learned to the have-nots. They don't like it when our writers can ignite us into fighters. But it's tough. We've had enough and we are coming. They don't like it when the common people sing a single song. They don't like it when forgotten people realise we're strong. They don't like when race and gender join with class as one agenda. They don't like when race and gender join with class as one agenda. They don't like when race and gender join with class as one agenda, but it's tough, we've had enough and we are coming. They don't like it when our classes are not coward, but empowered. They don't like it when the masses clock the power that is ours. They don't like it when their victims will not suck their fucking dictums, but it's tough, we've had enough and we are coming millions strong. It's tough, we've had enough and we are coming. Thank you for listening. Well done, everybody, today. Let's keep coming. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.